got another minute of strumming to do. Well, good morning to you, sisters and brothers, and welcome to our worship service. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning. I'm Pastor Mark. For those of you who uh, may not know who I am, I do notice that there are a few uh, new faces with us. And so welcome here to our worship service on this, the fifth uh, Sunday of Easter. Um, I want to say a special thank you for everybody that came out on Wednesday night uh, and took part and made donations and, and ate uh, some of the chicken dinner that the Topside prepared for us. Uh, we ended up serving uh, 315 of our brothers and sisters here in our community. So thank you to everybody who was able to, to take a part in making that happen. Um, as far as the announcements for this morning, and this is for the fellas, uh, our men's group is going to meet uh, this Saturday at 7.30 in the morning. And what we're going to do is arrange the uh, fellowship hall to where we're going to be able to be socially distant from one another still be able to enter to a time of fellowship and prayer and, and Bible study with one another. Um, if you do intend on coming, what we ask you to do is to send Butch an email uh, so he knows exactly how many to be ready for. There's not going to be any cooking going on in the kitchen. Instead, he's going to run by and get some biscuits, but he needs to know how many uh, to provide for. So if you want to come to the men's breakfast this Saturday, 730, uh, send Butch an email let him know uh, that you are coming. Honk your horn if you love your mother. I can't honk a horn. Today, today is, is Mother's Day, and so happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are here with us and all the mothers that are watching uh, online. Um, thinking about our mothers and how much they mean to us is, is where we're going to start this morning. And so I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Lord, on this day, set aside to honor and remember mothers, we give you thanks for our mothers. We are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from you and gave it to us. Thank you for the sacrifices they made in carrying us and giving us birth. We thank you for the women who raised us who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth mom, adopted mom, older sister, aunt, grandmother, stepmother, or someone else. We thank you for those women who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love they showed us and that they would be pleased to be called our moms. We pray for moms whose children are grown Grant them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for moms experiencing changes they could not predict. Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for pregnant women who will soon be moms. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Give them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who enjoy financial abundance. Grant them time to share with their family. We pray for moms who are raising their children in poverty. Grant them relief and justice. We pray for stepmoms. Grant them patience, understanding, and love. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. 
We pray for moms in marriages that are in crisis. Grant them support and insight. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for adoptive mothers. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for women who think about becoming mothers. Grant them wisdom and discernment. We pray for women who desperately want or wanted to be mothers. Grant them grace to accept your timing. We pray for women who have assumed the mother's role in a child's life. Grant them joy in the appreciation of others. We pray for persons who are grieving the loss of their mother and mothers grieving the loss of their child. Grant them comfort and hope in Christ's resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the gift of motherhood. We thank you for the many examples of faithful mothers in Scripture. We are mindful this day of all these women, and especially Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had the courage and faith to say yes to your calling. May these women gather for worship here today, emulate these examples of faith, and may they model for all the rest of us what it means to be your disciples. Bless them on this special day. Help them to know how much we love them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, if you take your song sheets out, not where I am, there you may also be. In my father's house, there are many, many rooms. In my father's house, there are many,
is our call to worship this morning is Psalm 31, verses 1 through 16. Psalm 31, verses 1 through 16. And as you either read these words or hear these words being spoken this morning, uh, kind of picture in your mind what the psalmist is going through. When you read these words, it seems as if the whole world is falling down upon him. That he's, tr he's troubled on every, every way, shape, and form as you can imagine. Yet at the same time, the psalmist understands exactly where his hope lies and where his strength lies and the one thing that he can count on, which is our, our God. But here now, Psalm 31, verses 1 through 16, our call to worship. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have taken heed of my adversities. You have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Amen. Amen. As we come to our first reading of Scripture for this morning, and we await with joyous and great anticipation what the Lord would have be revealed to us through his written word, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the first letter of St. Peter. Chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Again, this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. And St. Peter writes these words. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder has rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. 
They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Well, sisters and brothers, we read from Scripture, and I hope we know from our own experiences that our God is merciful and compassionate. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is close to all who call to him in truth, listening for their cries of help or for help, and offering to them salvation. And so at this time, I want to invite you, let's all bring our confessions to God, knowing that God will hear our prayers and forgive. Let us now pray to God, confessing our sins and seeking forgiveness First in silence. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, may Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in life eternal. Amen. Our Apostles' Creed is deeply rooted in a congregational worship setting such as this one. The early church would often confess the Apostles' Creed together before receiving communion or before baptisms or as a general act of worship. This helped the church to articulate and confess the faith in one voice. To confess the creed together with fellow believers is more than just mindlessly reciting a list of dusty facts. It is an act of worship when it is connected to loving God with our heart, soul, mind and strength and also loving our neighbors as ourselves a worshipful use of the apostles creed connects to the deepest part of our being and the heart of almighty god and so having said that i want to invite you to join me as we say with one voice our statement of faith our profession of faith our apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, our gospel lesson this morning in the sermon text come from the fourth gospel, the gospel of St. John. This morning we'll be reading chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Again, this is John chapter 14, 
verses 1 through 14. The evangelist writes these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. Now know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have you been with me all this time, Philip? And you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Are you a big picture person or are you a details person? You know, they say there are two types of people in our world, the big picture people and the details people. The big picture people tend to be creative and strategic and visionary. They can also be messy, disorganized, and forgetful. On the other hand, details people are conscientious and planful and exacting, but sometimes can lack perspective or fail to prioritize. Now, I must confess that I consider myself to be a big picture person. I think on occasion I have pretty good ideas that I approach things somewhat creatively with a pretty good end result or a destination in mind. Unfortunately, what that means is that certain details can get missed or overlooked as I make my way towards my intended destination. One example is the virtual prayer room that we had this past Thursday. See, I had the idea that since last Thursday was the National Day of Prayer, and we weren't able to get together in our sanctuary and pray together as a congregation, that I would, using Facebook Live, set a camera pointed at our altar, and I would let it run for an hour, and I would play music in the background, and it would give us all the time where we could come together where we were and enter into a time of prayer together. In fact, I saved that video on a YouTube channel we have here at the church so that no matter where you were at any time, you could enter into that prayer room and be able to pray. Pretty good idea, I thought, and fairly simple to execute. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, about 30 minutes into that live stream video, as I was praying over the requests that were coming in, our friends at Facebook put a red banner across my screen. You couldn't see it where you were, but they put a red banner across my screen. They roughly said that Facebook was going to remove that live stream soon if I continued to use music that I didn't have a license to broadcast live. That thought never occurred to me. That doing a live stream and playing music in the background, you would need to be using music that you were created. <laughs> or that you had a license to broadcast. 
Now, some of you are sitting there right now and saying, well, yeah, of course, you can't live stream music that you don't have a license to. Okay. Well, one, I could have used you on Thursday. <laughs> and two, that means that you're a details person. Now, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. And in fact, I think that we find success as a culture when a big picture person and a details person come together and work in concert. And honestly, either way is appropriate as we approach certain aspects of our life. But what about when we approach our God? In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus is addressing his disciples. At this point in the gospel, he has spoken of a frightening future. He's spoken to them about his betrayal. He's spoken to them about Peter's denial. He's spoken to them about troubled times. And now... Reasonably, I think, the disciples have questions. In the chapter before this one, Peter wants to know exactly where is it that Jesus says he is going when he tells them he has to leave. And when Jesus answers in a way that is less than specific, Thomas argues with him that if they don't know where Jesus is going, then they themselves are not going to know the way. You see, for these disciples, there is great comfort in the details. They seem to be detail-oriented folk. And faced with a problematic future, they want more than promises. They want times and places and hows and whys. They want to know precisely how it is that we're going to get from point A to point B. They would like a clear set of directions so they know how to navigate exactly what is going to be coming their way in the future. Jesus, however, simply offers them a promise and his presence a promise and his presence his promise is this he is working on their behalf without giving explicit details he says he is preparing a place for them and promises to come back to them and take them to himself and then when pressed a little bit further jesus moves from this promise to his presence and he says to Thomas what I honestly believe are some of the most profound, most comforting, most beautiful words ever recorded in human history. I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus sees his disciples facing future uncertainty and responds not with details about dates and times and procedures to follow, but with his promise and his presence. I am the way, the truth. And the life. They may not know specifically where they are going, but as long as they are with Jesus, they know that they are on the way. With his promises to comfort them and his presence to guide them, they can face an uncertain future. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus tells them. Believe in God, believe also in me. Sisters and brothers, in that same faith, with these same promises to comfort us and his presence to guide us, we can face our uncertain future. Today, our Lord still invites us to live in this same trust. Viral pandemics create uncertainty. We are certainly living in that reality right now. We are not sure where we are exactly in the timeline as this virus continues to unfold. Even the guidelines we get from leaders and government are a little bit short on some of the details. We're not sure how we're going to all recover from the suffering. The way forward for us does appear to be hard. We want some assurance of where we are going, how we're going to get there, and precisely what is going to happen along the way. Today, friends, Jesus answers our problems and concerns, but not with specific details. Instead, he calls us to a life of trust. Trusting that he is the way, that he is truth, that he is life. That no matter and whatever happens, he is there with you. In his death and resurrection, he has shown you the depth of his love. In his ascension to heaven, he has shown you the breadth of his rule. While you may not know what is going to happen... You do know, friends, where you are. You are in the hands of a God who loves you. After all, it is out of love that Jesus came for you, 
Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. Jesus rules for you. And Jesus promises ultimately to return for you. His way is long enough that it leads through all suffering. His truth is clear enough that it reveals whom to trust. His life is strong enough that it brings us to a new creation. With Jesus as our way, as our truth, and as our life, sisters and brothers, yes, we have enough. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want to close this morning by reading from the devotional that we've been using with our daily Bible studies together on Facebook. It gives another perspective on the promise and presence of Jesus Christ as relayed from those beautiful words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it says the fullness of these precious words can probably never be taken in by man. He that attempts to unfold them does little more than scratch the surface of a rich soil. Christ is the way, the way to heaven and peace with God. He is not only the guide and teacher and lawgiver like Moses, he is himself the door, the ladder and the road through whom we must draw near to God. He has opened the way to the tree of life, which was closed when Adam and Eve fell by the satisfaction he made for us on the cross. Through his blood, we may draw near with boldness and have access with confidence into God's presence. Christ is the truth, the whole substance of true religion which the mind of man requires. Without him, the wisest heathen groped in gross darkness and knew nothing about God. Before he came, even the Jews saw through a glass darkly and discerned nothing distinctly under the types, figures, and ceremonies of the Mosaic law. Christ is the whole truth and meets and satisfies every desire of the human mind. Christ is the life, the sinner's title to eternal life and pardon, the believer's root of spiritual life and holiness, the surety of the Christian's resurrection life. He that believeth on Christ has everlasting life. He that abideth in him as the branch abides in the vine shall bring forth much fruit. He that believeth on him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The root of all life. For soul and for body is Christ. Forever let us grasp and hold these truths fast. To use Christ daily as the way, to believe Christ daily as the truth, to live on Christ daily as the life. This is to be a well-informed, a thoroughly furnished, and an established Christian. And so friends, I simply ask this question. In this time of uncertainty and doubt and want and scarcity, friends, if we have Christ, then truly what more do we need? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, deliverer of our daily bread. We, your children, come before you hungry and thirsty for the spiritual nourishment that only you can provide. For we have tasted that you are good and we cannot live without your goodness. God in Christ, the cornerstone of our fellowship and faith, we, your living stones, come to be built up together as your house, your design. For we are ready to be chiseled and polished until we are fit for your present purpose for us. Forgive us, gracious God, if we are feeding ourselves on the junk food of idols, stuffing ourselves full of excessive meals, our fridges and freezers with much that will go to waste, and our homes with space and possessions that we do not truly need. And if we are those of your children, Lord, who are at this moment having a hard time making ends meet, that show us where and who to ask, where to seek and the doors upon which we should knock. Reveal to us who in our faith family we might approach for sharing or help. Living God, if we have lost the life in us and become as dry, luster-lacking dead stones, then forgive us. 
Refresh us with water and spirit that we may emerge gleaming with your presence and filled again with a passion for the gospel. Compassionate God, in the quietness now, we make our personal prayers to you, our confessions of wrongdoing, our needs for healing, our offloading of anything that troubles or burdens us, and the names of those who are on our minds and in our hearts this morning. Through the silence, Lord, hear our prayers at this time. God, whose spirit interprets our deepest longings, we praise you for your never-ending and limitless love and mercy. Make us ready to feast upon your word today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, using those familiar words that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time now for the collection of God's tithes and our offerings. Just a reminder, the ushers will come through with a bucket, and all you have to do is to hang your offering out the window and drop it into the bucket.
Loving God, as we offer our gifts to you, we know you see us more clearly than the world sees us, or even than we see ourselves. We have made foolish choices, valued things that were not worthy, and yet you have claimed us, deemed us precious, counted us worth saving by the death and resurrection of your Son. No gift that we can offer can come close to balancing out your relentless love, but we give them with a heart of gratitude. We give ourselves in the name of the one you gave for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, we come to a close this morning. I want to remind everybody, invite you to be part of our Gospel of John Bible study. We do Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock on Facebook Live. It's on my personal uh, Facebook page. So if you just search my name, Mark O'Neill, Mark with the C, O'Neill, O-N-E-A-L, you'll find it. We will be live again Monday through Friday going through the Gospel of John. And I invite everybody to come out and be part of that. As we close this morning, I want to offer up to you our words of our benediction. May the Lord who brought us to birth by his spirit strengthen us for the Christian life. May the Lord who provides for all our needs sustain us day by day. May the Lord whose steadfast love is constant as a mother's care send us out to live and work for others. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. We go now to love and serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing it.